Please so thank you everyone for coming and whatever level of engagement and interest you're able to muster from your very intense games will, will be welcome, at least briefly. Um, there's a lot of regulars here so you might have heard a lot of the tales but Imad might have some new ones. My name is Harry Bubbins, I'm with the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation and we work to preserve the cultural and architectural heritage of Greenwich Village, NoHo and the East Village. And Tonight, we're honored to share at the Chess Forum with all of you, Imad Hashan, who has owned and run this place for 21 years, and uh, part of that is the reason why they were selected as our October Business of the Month. Every month, based on nominations and votes from the community and members that we are dependent upon, uh, we pick a local business that represents the essence of our communities, from the East Village to Greenwich Village and NoHo, as I said. We have honored Screaming Mimi's, which recently moved from Lafayette to 14th Street, Casa Adela on Avenue C, and the Silversmith Shop on a very small nook uh, in uh, not far from here in Greenwich Village. So we wanted to honor on the eve of World Chess Championship tomorrow that's taking place in New York for the first time in decades Imad and his stories of chess, culture, how it's changed over the decades, how the neighborhood has changed, and uh, his own insights and stories. And some of you are familiar with him already, but maybe he'll regale us with a special tale. So let's give him a round of applause. Welcome to Chess Forum. Thank you, Mr. Harry. Welcome, everyone, including the regulars, especially Mike. Chess Forum. The evening of the World Championship. <laughs> Happy to be president to everybody. Uh, to, the talk tonight is about most of you, the regulars, would know the story of chess in the village, which, from my own recollection, started with uh, Nicholas Mussolini, who was the first to open what was called in the 50s and 60s a chess studio or a chess parlor. And the first place was on Sullivan Street, in the corner of B. Uh, <laughs> Rosalino was a grand master from Russia. Uh, his parents were artists who escaped the communists to Paris and from there to New York. He himself followed them a few years later and opened a place where people could come and play. And in those days, some of the people now who are in their 60s, uh, uh, late 60s or early 60s, used to come to his place where you give them a chess problem for 25 cents to solve. Uh, but now we rely on to support this part of the room, which is to me the more important part, the community side, where people come and play, have a good time, and continue the, what I call smart people, not smartphones, to continue the thinking process happening in New York, relies on us selling things here. In those days, the part of his uh, operation relied on him driving a cab. And I think he was a Russian aristocracy. He was a judo master, an opera singer, and a chess grandmaster. And the uh, nice thing that I identify with him, I've never met him. I met his granddaughter. Every, she lives in Boston. Every few months, she comes to New York to a visit. And she comes here just to look at the place that her grandfather started, Catherine Rosalino. Uh, he, his thing was the aesthetic. He did not play a lot of winning games, but he always preferred to sacrifice a game if he can play a beautiful game. Uh, his store was, or his parlor, was on Sullivan, and uh, at one point he hired somebody to work for him. Most of the people in that time, as I was just saying, the pattern of immigration here is Atlantic Ocean. Europeans who came after the Second World War, or before that, or during the Soviet era, who came to New York and made it home and brought with them lots of things, including their passion for chess. So anybody who remembers the park in the 80s, it was filled with these older gentlemen who were fantastic at chess and who just played it for fun. That's like what we read or we see in movies that took place in mid-century or early century Europe. Uh, he opened the parlor there and one of his employees was from Germany around the place, eventually, as somebody made a documentary on that, he did a coup d'etat and shut down his boss's place and opened his own. Uh, 
After that, there was a little bit of a legal battle between the two persons, and uh, Rosalino ended opening, after losing his place on Sullivan Street, opening on this location with his wife. Her name was Vera from Spain. Uh, this became his headquarters. Uh, and where you, where you are sitting now, you are sitting in a room where people like Bobby Fisher used to come play normally. Uh, so this is really, this address, 217, 219 Thompson Street, is part of chess history in New York. Uh, Rosalino continued this tradition until he had an accident where he fell and hurt himself from a second floor balcony. And the, nobody found him. He was lying for hours in the back of a building until somebody found him. They took him to St. Vincent's Hospital where he died a few days later. And this place ended closing in 1976 when he died. His wife could not keep it up. Uh, so they, they moved out and it became a printing place in 1995. But mostly the chess scene in this area really rotated around the Washington Square Park. Uh, the most famous besides Bobby Fischer who played there is Marcel Duchamp, who I think lived on Washington Square North. And he even had in his apartment one of the chess tables that you see in the park. He bought it, or he stole it, or somehow he got one of the uh, into his apartment. Also, another famous player is, uh, I don't remember his name, the British director of 2001 Odyssey. Uh, Kubrick. Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick mm -hmm. was a regular player in those days in Washington Square Park. Uh, in 1995, again due to circumstances that were not planned or foreseen, uh, this place became available again, and uh, I took over the place and reopened, in a way, in the spirit of Rosalimo, we reopened this place. Considering how his story ended, I felt there was some sort of poetic justice, or chess justice, that the place that he lost in that state of urban conditions was reopened. And so we opened it in 1995, and this was almost the last era the end of an era of the human interaction where people like our regulars who still really support and keep the place up and our loved ones every day in all weather conditions just to play chess, no other, there is nothing else to do here or to gain except this mental exercise. Uh, that we came at an era where technology was starting to push in and the human interaction was beginning something uh, old fashioned. And maybe the culmination of that was uh, 1997 when Kasparov played against Deep Blue <coughs> and he lost to it, thus ending the era of a human beating a machine in chess. But it, it, it's interesting, the year we opened, and it was a big help for us as a business, September 1995, the World Championship was happening. Just like tomorrow, the first time in 21 years, the World Chess Championship is coming to New York. Uh, in 1995, it was Kasparov against Anand in the World Trade Center, floor 107. Uh, so I hope this is not a, a sign for us. We open at the World Championship and we close at the other World Championship that comes to New York. Uh, we were hoping my own fantasy or fantasy was that this World Championship would take place in the World Trade Center as well. But as I understand, for security reasons, they did not want anybody near that place. Uh, so our fantasy was that an American would be playing, in particular Fabiano Caruana, who started his chess career as a four-year-old kid in this room, uh, that it would take care of place in New York, and that uh, it would be in the World Trade Center in honor of the old World Trade Center. We were people settled for two or three of their wishes. We had to settle for one. Uh, it's not an American champion, who would have been the first since Bobby Fischer in 1972. It's not in the World Trade Center, but it's in New York at least. So one out of three is still, is still good. It will be in the uh, South Street Seaport, starting tomorrow around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, till the end of the month. Uh, in, in this period, between these two tournaments, last time I think it was $20 in there, that gives you an idea. Now it is $75 per day. And now it's being, there's even a package that you pay $3,000. Chess is mostly a smart man's, a poor man's, intellectual man's game, not a rich man's game. Now it's, 
this time around, I feel it's getting with that three thousand uh, dollar for tickets, getting that in front of other sports with uh, an event to make money from, it, which is, doesn't fit really the dignity or uh, the honor that chess deserves. It's about the intellect, not about the work. But that's the world we live in. So speak, speaking about that kind of monetary value being more dominant in our culture more and more, can you speak to how that's influenced and impacted your business in the neighborhood? That's actually what I was coming for. And these, between these two events, 95 to 2016, not just chess, was the whole city changed, maybe the whole world changed. First, on the technological front, where slowly, slowly the machine was taking over from man, software became available, we started seeing less and less players who prefer to stay at home and play on their computer rather than come and play face to face. Uh, the thing we relied on selling things to people, it became less and less as people bought. Uh, everything around us, rents became so expensive that more and more businesses like this one started disappearing, making place. The pattern, again, I think, the pattern of immigration changed to this country from give me your poor and wretched, where you would come with your family, start a business, a restaurant with a few thousand dollars and build it and raise a family from it. It could be even also driving a yellow cab to a world where a man would have a big job and has a nice SUV but steals the job of the yellow cab driver with Uber. That's one of the big things that the, the people that I know who came from the Middle East, Africa, India, and raised families on driving a cab are now being fighting for their existence against a guy who has a job but will also want your job. Same thing with stores. It used to be give me your ratchet, now give me your capitalists, give me your launderers. And if it was money to buy an apartment in Manhattan for 50 million, and maybe not come to it except once or twice a year, he is the man who's uh, really running the show now. He's the man who's buying an apartment and making everything around them expensive. Slowly, slowly, the streets that used to be, this place that used to be filled with these revolutionaries, these idealists, uh, anarchists, the squatters who lived in the East Village, they played, they played violin on the subway and collected quarters and came to play chess and then they went and jumped behind the boarded apartments or buildings on the Lower East Side in the East Village and they lived there. They disappeared. Uh, the people who sold books in the streets disappeared. The people who sold the videos, the, 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 the city that had almost a nature of an agricultural society where there's a lot in agriculture. Farmers recycle. They don't. They're, nothing goes to waste. New York was like that. You would be walking down the street with a friend. You find somebody else's furniture on the sidewalk, and you have a friend take it to his home. People recycle. Nobody. Not everybody bought new furniture. People left things for other people to use, whether for free or you bought it for pennies. Uh, the homeless who are funny and interesting and wouldn't. Some was bad, but some would sing you a song for a quarter. Some will tell you a joke, some will give you an act. Uh, the, the village that we all came to thinking is literally a village in the agricultural sense without the ghosts and the chickens. But that kind of mentality that the people who went to the park and stood and lectured all day long, everybody on a different topic, uh, you don't see that anymore. The people who stand to say maybe the last of uh, these characters that is Donald Trump, uh, abrasive. Uh, almost violent, angry. That was the New Yorker. You, uh, the opinionated, who is not shy to say what he thinks. But the thing about, unlike maybe any other place in the country or in the world, uh, is good heart. So everybody tells you, you will hear from a New Yorker what he thinks of you. But that's that. There isn't resentment, there aren't grudges. Now you see, like a whole, here, the place, I was always saying, we used, every sale was a big bargain. It was just like, you open a bazaar and you start marketing. Now people just come if they like the younger generation. They pay, they buy, they leave. None of, none of that uh, social interaction. That made the city, your business is everybody's business. If you needed help, everybody helped you. I remember when I was new in the city, you asked directions, people actually walked with you. They didn't point you. A few years ago, my father was here and got lost just at the corner. Somebody showed them how to get here to the store from Zika. And they said, when I looked back, they were still standing, watching me to see that I made it to the place. 
that, that used to be the New Yorker. Uh, a tough city, but with a good heart. Now, it's, add to that the technology, it became a very lonely city. This, the thing I miss most was this, what you see now, was every night, 24 hours. Then I remember, right, maybe, well, I live next door for that reason. I even developed knee problems for standing almost, I open at 11 a.m. and stay here till 6 a.m. Just serving coffee and tea and people playing all night long. This is the night, it's 95 to around 2005. After that, 2007, the iPhone appeared. And this whole thing became a thing of the past. 2006, of course, the economy collapsed. And people, discriminatory income became less. 2007, you did not need to wrestle with yourself to you spend or not. You can get what you want. You don't need to spend a penny. You stay at home, play live or over the world. That part is what is missed the most here, is the community. People who came with a world championship. Like tomorrow, I remember people coming with their bags from work, straight, we had a computer, IBM, that would move very slowly uh, because it was phone connection, there was no cable. And we stand, wait 20 minutes for the computer to make a move. <laughs> and then we come and people analyze it here. TV stations would come and talk to people, journalists, because this is the, you look for community. You want about chess, you want to the chess community. And people were innocent, almost like children. None of us is any good players in comparison to what's happening, but people analyzed at their level. They brought in their input. We came in with a piece of information. I had something that I heard together. We built that puzzle, that picture of what happened today in the chess uh, tournament. Now we just let right, what is your oyster? You have a phone in your pocket. You look at the results. You go about your life, end of a story. That's, that's the thing is that is missed the most. Uh, whether it's chess story or any other story in your life, you came with it here to a place that was family. How many, I cannot tell you how many proposals happened here. How many people met, their first date was here. How many times I had to coordinate the music for the guy who came with the CD and the ring. Uh, because the first, the last one actually was recently, a Hasidic couple. They came and played, and they said thank you. We got engaged. Our first date was here. And we gave them a simple chest set as their first engagement gift. Uh, that was a daily routine. Uh, this is the first year in 10 years I noticed this is coming back. Younger people are coming back. This has not happened since 2007, since the iPhone appeared and other smartphones. And I think asking the younger crowd, they all say now they work what was 10 years ago, fun and entertainment. The iPhone, the app, the iPads, the computers. Now it became for the young generation work. Now they work in that sector. It's no longer entertainment. They work, they are programmers, they are computer engineers, they write apps. So once, I am, what's bringing you back is that because we work all day with computers, this is finally, in our spare time, we want this humanity. And I knew that eventually, as, as a social animal, we will miss each other. If I survive, then people remember people, then they will come back. It's like a parent or a home. You leave your home and run in the world discovering it. And when times change, you always in the back of your mind, your parents' home is home. So we left this as much as we can. We keep it always to leave a parent's home, wherever you go adventuring. In the world, you remember, you will know that when everything else fails, you have a seat here. Uh, so this is the first year we notice. He's coming. Uh, no, we are just having a gathering to talk about chess and this history of the day. And the presentation's almost over, so yeah. hang out, and then there'll be time to play. Great. Come over here. We'll get you set up soon. I want to, that's a good transition, but there's a lot of people as our new friends come in to play. Um, anyone here have any questions for Imad? Any particular questions? We can also have informal chit-chatting and, and talking over the food and drink. Um, and I will ask any of the masters, the old founding fathers, like Mike and Bobby and Fredo, uh, 
Well, I, I, that's probably a good moment. It looks like the energy is, is transforming, but we're all here to talk and communicate with each other as Iman was talking about and or just play intense chess quietly. Um, I wanted to share our friend Ramon here brought because of the specialness of this store and Imad's spirit um, a replica of the oldest existing chess book, the first chess book uh, drafted by monks in Spain. His team has made that. It's up front for you to peruse and touch its lambskin and calligraphy I understand. Yeah. Um, so Ramon is here to bring that to bless us and I understand Rahim is here for those who are beginners and maybe want to learn or have a particular lesson that's him raise your hand there and there's food and drink and you can continue to play and I want to say finally Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation is dependent upon our membership so consider joining us please sign in and another round of applause for Imad please A young man who is a professional photographer for National Geographic is spending time with the native Indian tribes of the Amazon Valley in Peru. When he asked us for the donation, we gave him a few sets, very simple stuff like the ones on the table. And now that's the power of this game. For the first time ever, some tribes in the Amazon Valley in Peru are discovering chess. And this this young man who is a he plays chess, but not professionally, but he's a professional photographer, is introducing a game at the end of this month. It will be a big tournament for young children in the Amazon Valley of Peru. So I'm just saying hello to Vincent, wherever he is. Second is uh, our friend, this great artist from Spain, Ramon. He suffers a similar situation to us. He told me a very touching story, which relates to our, the village situation. He told me he had his own workshop where he made these beautiful books replicas of ancient books from 12th century, 15th century, and faced the same situation where he was practically and kindly evicted. By, uh, can I say that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, totally true. Well, yeah. he, he told me that, I'll let him tell his story, but his landlord raised the rent excessively high, and he tried to negotiate, he said, I'm being nice to you because somebody else is waiting to pay double. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the situation we live in. That's why Mr. Harry and the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation are trying to save us before it all becomes one big happy or unhappy Starbucks. But only no more the wretched and the poor, it's now the corporate people who will make the city what I like to call another Boston. The Bostonization of New York, where every corner has uh, two Dunkin' Donuts on it, and in between the Starbucks. Uh, if we can save the city soon, I have today actually a real estate agent, a real breed, he has a heart. He said the landlords are shooting themselves in the foot. They are making a lot of money from the corporate businesses, but he said he's, they are making it as uninteresting to live in New York by making it all homogeneous, all corporate stores that exist anywhere in the world. You go anywhere, you'll have the same set of stores. What would bring tourists? In the short term, it's good for landlords. In the long term, as this country becomes more uh, service economy, not industry. In the long term, service is tourism. Uh, in the long term, tourists will have more to come. So hopefully we can still save this place and every place. Mr. Ramon? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for giving me the hope. Thank you. <coughs> so thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. Thank you very so much. It was like a week ago that I was uh, walking by and I had the opportunity to stand you know, up on this place. Uh, let me tell you, I come from Spain, I was teaching in LA. I uh, was a high school teacher. From there, I opened a software uh, education and software company. The last 10 years, I became I moved to New York with my wife. And uh, I became a member of the New York Society of Calligraphers. And I was engaged into the beautiful art of making illuminated manuscripts with calligraphy, uh, you know, gold leaf, uh, illumination, book binding, and all, all of this. I was working with my colleagues in Spain, which managed to get the rights to reproduce, which is called the first and unique book of chess that was put together in the 12th century by the king Alphonse the, Alphonse the 12th. 
in southern Spain, he assembled a, a group of uh, wise uh, people from within the Jewish, Arab, and Christian communities. And the main goal was this one. Let's put together just an amazing book that will teach everybody how to play chess. So there is a very limited edition of 300 copies, which is very identical as the original. I was very lucky and very happy to meet, you know, last week by accident, Amit. So I brought this money, this facsimile, it's called, which is a reproduction, very identical a reproduction. It's not cheap, it's not $5, it's, it's not $10, it's not for sale, this is my copy, but I want to share it with you. Yeah, anyhow, if someone might be interested, but this is serious business for collectors. I want to share this uh, facsimile with you guys. The uh, facsimile is going to be here for like a couple of weeks, three weeks. So uh, anyone that has the interest, there is not only the facsimile, there is a study guide with uh, 600 uh, pages, 300 in Spanish, 300 in English. There is a codicological analysis, a transcription from the Latin into the English. So basically, you can read the whole manuscript into English, whether you know the, uh, even the original is in Spanish. Okay. Uh, going back to the business that bring us here together, I was sharing as well, uh, as well you know, the same story. Our calligraphy studio is across from Google, 14th Street and 8th Avenue. We just finished the reproduction of the oldest Jewish uh, Sidur from the 5th century. Eight months of work to make just one single copy. It is amazing. We do it because of the love of the, the art. So, you know, always also you have to make some business, but it's so hard to see how out of the blue the rent goes in the double. Like, I mean, whatever. But I have that wrong, okay? So, anyhow, thank you guys. Thank you, Harry, for uh, the opportunity. I'm going to be joining you as well, okay? As a member of this community, and thank you to all of you. I admire your good brains when I see you playing chess. I have no clue what is this game all about, but I see all the smart people here. So thank you very much for giving me the time and the opportunity to talk to you. Okay. Thank you.